mountain Looked all around, couldn't find nobody I Went down into the deepest valley Looked all around, down there, couldn't find nobody Oh, I went across the deep blue sea Nobody greater than you.
Good morning. morning. Welcome to Washington National Cathedral. My name's Randy Hollerith. I'm the Dean of the Cathedral. And on behalf of Mary Ann Buddy, the Bishop of the Diocese of Washington, and all of my colleagues here, we're so glad that you've joined us today. And a special welcome to all of you who join us online from around the country and around the world. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. How many of you are visiting the cathedral today? Raise your hand if you're visiting. Welcome, we're so glad that you're here. Whatever has brought you here this morning, please know that this is a house of prayer for all people and you are always, always welcome here and hope you will come back and see us often. Now I know we have a special group here, the Unity Christian High School from Hudsonville, Michigan. Where are you guys? There you are, welcome, glad you're here. Today is the last Sunday of the academic year and the last Sunday for this group of acolytes that we have had all year long. They have done such an incredible job. This afternoon at four o'clock at Coral Evensong, we will uh, honor those who are moving on from the program and welcome a new class of acolytes. So would you join me in just thanking our acolytes for the amazing job that they do here at the cathedral. Today is one of the primary feast days in the church. It is Trinity Sunday. It's indeed a very special day when we honor God who is one in three and three in one. So we're glad you're with us today. So I invite you to take a deep breath with me. Let it out slowly. And let us center ourselves and calm ourselves and open ourselves to the Holy Spirit and to the Father and to the Son who are with us this morning. Thank you.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praying together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given to us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of your divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you in your one and eternal glory. O Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit live and reign one God forever and ever. Amen. A lesson from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, 
the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind and God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on earth and there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our own image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he made and indeed it was very good. And there were evening and there were, was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created the word of the Lord.
a lesson from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. Santo Evangelio de nuestro Señor Jesucristo según Mateo. Así pues, los once discípulos se fueron a Galilea, al cerro que Jesús les había indicado. Y cuando vieron a Jesús, lo adoraron, aunque algunos dudaban. Jesús se acercó a ellos y les dijo, Dios me ha dado toda autoridad en el cielo y en la tierra. Vayan pues a las gentes de todas las naciones y háganlas mis discípulos. Bautícenlas en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo y enséñenles a obedecer todo lo que les he mandado a ustedes. Por mi parte, yo estaré con ustedes todos los días hasta el fin del mundo. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of the Lord.
In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Trinity Sunday is in many ways one of the most unique Sundays of the year. The Book of Common Prayer styles it a principal feast, equal in importance to Easter, Christmas, and Pentecost, though I imagine few of us experience it as such. It is the only primary feast of the church year that celebrates a doctrinal claim, as opposed to an event from the life of Jesus or from the life of the early church, the implications of which we will return to soon when we look at the readings appointed for this day. Today seems to be about doctrine, and doctrine does not excite or capture our imagination in the same way as the rushing wind and speaking in tongues of Pentecost or the empty tomb an encounter with the risen Lord of Easter, or the Christ child wrapped in swaddling clothes with holy family and animals surrounding the manger of Christmas. Though we are not presented with a specific image or a scene that we can easily grasp onto this day, we are asked to consider and reflect on something of fundamental importance for our faith. Today, I would like to invite us into a consideration of why our belief in the Trinity and our celebration of it this Sunday matters, because it matters a great deal, not as a bit of abstract doctrine, but as something vital for our daily life of faith. At the start, we must acknowledge that we are dealing with mystery at the deepest level, by which I don't mean to imply anything negative, but simply to highlight that we are seeking to speak about truth that can never be fully known or understood, truth that our limited words and language will always prove inadequate in describing. If you find the concept of the Trinity to be confusing or mystifying, welcome to the very good company of the faithful across the centuries. It presents us with the paradoxical tension between remoteness and intimacy, between the familiar and the incomprehensible. God is beyond our ability to ever fully understand and yet is revealed to us in human form in Jesus, experienced and known to us in that undeniable presence of the Holy Spirit. The soaring prologue to John's Gospel puts it this way, no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known. No one has ever seen God, yet we have seen God in Jesus Christ, the Son. Such truth and seeming contradiction is so characteristic of the sort of language required when discussing the Trinity, a mystery that defies our ability to comprehend because it touches at the core and identity of God leading us toward God's holiness and majesty, which demands less keen theological insights and more awe, reverence, and worship. Where then can we even begin to explore this theological truth? The Catechism at the back of the prayer book simply says this, the Trinity is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. While succinctly capturing the idea of one God in three persons, of unity and in diversity, that definition does mask the considerable complexity that underlies it. 
Perhaps the most significant challenge when examining the Trinity is the highly technical language that emerged as the church worked towards this understanding well into the course of the 300s, some almost 300 years after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Though this complex history and theology is no doubt richly informative, our starting point must be, as it was for those theologians of the early church, with Scripture. And here, we are immediately confronted with a great paradox. The Trinity is rooted in a deep engagement with the scriptural narrative. That is to say, it is thoroughly scriptural. Yet, there are few, if any, specific passages that explicitly define it and serve as foundation for the doctrine. The word Trinity, for example, does not appear anywhere in the Bible. Even the explicit use of the Trinitarian formula, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is surprisingly quite rare. This morning, we heard the two most important passages containing a clear example of it. The first, the final verse of St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, includes the beautiful text, often referred to simply as the grace that has long been used in the context of worship. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The second passage from the final chapter of Matthew's Gospel includes the Great Commission and Jesus' instruction to the eleven to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, as important, as beautiful as these two passages are, they hardly constitute the foundation upon which a systematic understanding of the Trinity can be built. A clear and concise scriptural explanation of, that, of the idea is not to be found. Instead, the doctrine emerges from the Christian community's experience of God and from the sustained reflection and engagement with the narrative of God's mighty acts as revealed in Holy Scripture experience of God's power, of God's presence within the life of the community was then the foundation and the starting point from which a process of deliberation unfolded. Beginning with those who lived in the immediate reality of the resurrection. The first question to be grappled with was how to understand the identity of Jesus. Who was this Jesus of Nazareth who had died but risen from the dead? One of the earliest assertions, something we might think of as a creed, was the simple statement, Jesus Christ is Lord. Later expanded to the full understanding that Jesus was truly human and truly God. This Jesus was born of his mother, Mary, but also, as those who experienced his healing and loving presence could testify, was one who reflected the glory of God, who was indeed none other than God incarnate, the Word made flesh dwelling among us. In that brief portion of Matthew's Gospel we hear today, we saw that when the eleven came to Jesus, they, they worshipped him. A recognition that they saw him not just as human, but as their Lord and their God, worthy of worship. 
as the church came to understand and define how this Jesus, the Christ, related to God. There was a growing effort to understand the role and identity of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, the Advocate, who in keeping with Jesus' promise, promise was poured out on the apostles that great Pentecost day. Though this Spirit is attested to throughout Scripture, it took prolonged theological reflection well into the fourth century by some of the greatest theologians in the church's history to finally affirm that the Holy Spirit is divine, is indeed God, sanctifying us through baptism, still working in the world and the church even now. Our understanding of the Trinity naturally followed these reflections on the nature of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. It was not an esoteric theological formulation designed by detached theologians. It was a faithful encapsulation of the Christian experience of God. The one God who created the universe and all that is was revealed in human flesh in Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who suffered, died, and was raised to new life, and abides even now with us through the Holy Spirit. This God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the one we know, trust, love, and adore. At the heart of this mystery that is the Trinity is relationship. Relationship of perfect love. And while that is a lovely theological claim about the divine, there are significant consequences for us as well, evidenced by that very extended, sweeping narrative of the creation that we heard from the book of Genesis. There we hear that God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. The implications of this idea are profound. As children of God, we are created in love, bearing the image of this God who is perfect love in relationship. It is a vision of the sort of life that we are called to live. Of course, we fall short of this ideal. But with God's help, we are called to ever grow into the fullness of this image of God, to grow into harmony and to loving relationship with, with God, with one another, with all of creation. The Orthodox tradition calls this idea theosis, or divinization, a rather fancy term for a remarkable process of constant growth, constant movement toward union with God. Or to take that fancy Greek word at its literal meaning of being made like God. Now, this startling claim does not confuse creator God with creature us. It's not saying we literally become like God in God's essence. But instead, it proclaims that as Christ Jesus humbled himself to share in our humanity, so too might we be raised to that divine life, that fellowship of love that is the Trinity. In short, it's growing into the likeness of God, into the image in which we were created. That journey begins at baptism, that great sacrament of cleansing and incorporation into the church, which in keeping with Jesus' command to the eleven, continues to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
Baptism welcomes us into this divine life and initiates this never-ending process of growth, of movement, even as it empowers us and sends us forth for mission and service in the world. This growth into the fullness of God's image and likeness is a journey that is never completed this side of the life to come. Before this feast day of the Holy Trinity was adopted by the Church Universal sometime in the 1300s, there had been fairly significant opposition to the idea of establishing it. Not because of any opposition to the doctrine, but instead because it was thought that the Trinity was properly celebrated and honored each and every day in the offerings of prayer and worship that reflect the Trinitarian life. There is, I think, wisdom in this way of thinking. The celebration of this mystery ought to be less something we turn to only once a year on this very unique day, and instead become something we live out in the daily life of discipleship, in our striving to grow into the fullness of our created nature. As we worship this God of unity in diversity, this God of perfect love in relationship, whoever summons us to grow in that image and to dwell in that eternal love, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Holy, holy, holy God, in calling forth creation from the void, revealing yourself in human flesh and pouring forth your wisdom to guide us, you manifest your love for all creation. As your people, we lift our voices, gathering the world's needs into our hearts and bringing them before you. That the church may grow in unity and love 
bearing witness to the triune God to the ends of the earth. Holy Trinity, that all humankind may exercise its stewardship of creation in thoughtful, loving, and responsible ways. We pray for the human family that we may live together in your peace. Holy Trinity, that our nation will be blessed with a sense of common purpose and unity. We give thanks for the gift of democracy and the rule of law. We pray for Joseph, President of the United States, members of the Congress, the Supreme Court, and in all positions of public trust. Guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace. In the cathedral's weekly observance of prayers for the states and territories, we hold before you the people and government of New Mexico. Holy Trinity, that you would surround with your love all whose lives have been forever changed by gun violence. We pray for an end to such violence in our nation, that our schools, houses of worship, and communities may become places of safety for all. Holy Trinity, that all who seek healing and all who are in special need of grace and strength may be surrounded by your loving presence. We hold before you Michael, our presiding bishop, and pray for full restoration of health. Holy Trinity, we pray for those who mourn, all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, may they have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Holy Trinity, Holy, holy, holy God, fill us with strength and courage, with discernment and compassion, that we may be instruments of justice and love in this world, that it may be on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Peace to you from God our Creator, peace from God's Son, Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Peace from the Holy Spirit, the life giver. The peace of the triune God be always with you. Please be seated. Once again, welcome. It's a joy to have all of you with us this morning. We move now into the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, the Eucharist. And please know that everyone is invited to receive communion today if you would like to. We'll be serving both, offering both bread and wine. And we have gluten-free bread for those who might need it. So please don't hesitate to ask when you come forward. 
You are welcome to receive bread and wine, or just the bread if you prefer. If you decide you would like to receive the wine as well, we ask that you please uh, drink from the chalice and not attempt to uh, intinct or dip your bread in the chalice. If you'd rather not receive communion, you're welcome to stay in your seats, but I hope you will come forward when other people come forward and just cross your arms over your chest. That way we know you'd rather not receive communion, but we'll offer you a prayer and a blessing. Finally, if you are able, I hope you will support the cathedral in our mission and in our ministry. So many people think we're funded by the federal government or the national church, but we're not. All the money that we raise comes from private donation. So if you are able to help us this morning, we'd be most grateful. We will be passing the plate around as is our custom, but also now we have a QR code on the back of your bulletin that you can use if you'd like to give digitally. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, O Holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. For with your co-eternal Son and Holy Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons and in unity of being. And we celebrate the one and equal glory of you, O Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, joining with our archangels and with all the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now offer, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may, be, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with our patrons, the apostles Peter and Paul, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever.
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, to take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
praying together. Almighty and eternal God, you have revealed yourself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and live and reign in the perfect unity of love. Hold us firm in this faith, that we may know you in all your ways, and evermore rejoice in your eternal glory, who are three persons, yet one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the holy and undivided Trinity guard you, save you, and bring you to that heavenly city where he lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.
The eternal creator calls us, the risen savior sends us, the dynamic spirit empowers us. Go in peace to serve the triune God. Thanks be to God.